acknowledgement now. Good. So um, just as acknowledgement of country, I am presenting to you on the lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. And also, obviously, all of you will be on the lands of various traditional owners, mostly in Australia, but some all over the world. So I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. So we have um, this presentation by um, Dr. Alex, um, which is part of our Home Future Food Hallmark. This is a project funded by the university and it's multidisciplinary. So many of the people with their cameras on now are actually involved in the research in the Hallmark. Min's going to, Dr. Minha is going to put the, a, web, a link to the website for this project into the chat. And um, I'm the chair for the Future Food Hallmark project. Uh, Minha is the academic convener and Georgi, who will be chairing this session today, is actually one of the theme leaders. We have several of the theme leaders um, on the session today. So um, we, we have a website for that where we have a number of research projects and reports and outcomes. We put our seminars on that website also. So this is the inaugural seminar um, which will be a monthly series going forward right through to, into 2022. Um, this is the inaugural, inaugural seminar for the Future Food Hallmark. So what is the Future Food Hallmark? It's actually a research initiative funded by the university because the university considers it's very important for us to get some multidisciplinary research going. So we have about seven faculties as well as CSRO involved in our project. And this hallmark is based on the focus on the production of alternative proteins and the development of sustainable, healthy and affordable protein products. So that's as much as I wanted to say, I encourage you to um, certainly, oh, I wanted to thank, sorry, thank Dr. Min Ha for convening this seminar today, who's our academic convener. Thank you, Min. And now I will hand over to Georgi, who's our theme leader for community, social and food security drivers. Thanks, Georgi. Thank you, Robin. Um, and look, yeah, I just want to give a quick intro uh, uh, to Alex. Uh, we're really pleased that Alex agreed to give this seminar. Uh, so just uh, hopefully you already read her bio, but I'll just give a, a very quick sort of summary. Uh, Alex is a research fellow at the University of Sheffield. She completed her PhD uh, in 2017 at King's College in London. And then she worked as a research fellow at the University of Oxford um, before more recently moving to Sheffield to take up her latest uh, fellowship. Now, throughout her doctoral studies and since then, Alex has been researching alternative proteins. And I think she's been at the forefront of critical social science analysis internationally of plant-based and cell-based meats uh, and dairy alternatives. Now, Alex draws on a range of disciplinary um, perspectives from geography, politics, history, uh, and science and technology studies. And she's been examining some of the promissory claims uh, of the alternative protein industries and the debates and conflicts between these new industries and the livestock industries. She's currently exploring what role these products might play in the UK food system uh, in the future. She's also a founding member of the group Cultivate, which is a multi-voiced forum intended to support informed dialogue about the emergent field of cellular agriculture from UK perspectives. So in today's seminar, she'll explore the implications of alternative proteins present to the future of food and farming. She'll examine how these technologies are redefining our understandings of what food is and should be in a time of planetary crisis. At the same time as they, they are redefining who and where power is concentrated in food production. So today, Alex will speak for around 30 to 40 minutes uh, and then we'll open up for questions. So um, please do ask some questions at the end. Uh, you can, I, I just encourage you just to speak your questions, but you can also put them straight into the chat function um, during the seminar as well. Thank you, Alex, over to you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Georgi and, uh, and Robin and Min for, for that introduction and for inviting me. It's, it's really um, wonderful to be with you all. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, Hopefully, has that one worked? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to put this in myself. Great. So, yeah, no, as I say, it's wonderful to be here and um, I've been following uh, 
from Gyogi, you know, the work that, that you've all been doing on this particular um, subject. And it would be great just to, to share my work that I've been doing for nearly a decade now on um, this particular vision of future foods, future proteins. So really what this um, lecture is, is going to be a kind of whistle-stop tour of the work that I've been doing, uh, kind of touching on a bunch of themes, a bunch of uh, implications um, that, that I've been thinking through um, as a social scientist. So I'm a human geographer by training. Um, and really that, that has been my focus, thinking through what the, the political, economic um, and social implications could be if we sort of shift to these new alternatives or, or different alternative uh, proteins um, and away from conventional animal agriculture. So um, this is the overview for today. So I'm just going to really briefly um, give a, a sort of overview of what I'm talking about when I'm, I'm using this term alternative proteins, just to say that it, it's this kind of clunky, it, it's quite a clunky umbrella term. I'm not you know, a huge fan of it, but it's the best I've sort of found so far for trying to capture a broad range of approaches and products. Um, so I'll just sort of indicate what I mean uh, by that term, and then we'll get into some of the implications um, that I've been uh, looking into and, and the three that, that I'm going to focus on today. So the first one is um, probably the most conceptual um, and then the other two are thinking maybe a bit more sort of on the ground realities, how, how these alternatives are sort of reimagining um, how food systems and particularly protein food systems um, are organised um, and how these foods are, are being produced. So I'm going to get into it just uh, for the purposes of time. So when I'm talking about alternative proteins, as I say, is this kind of uh, umbrella term for a range of products that have, have kind of come on the scene in the last, uh, well, just over a, a decade now. Um, so the first category that falls under this is, is a sort of new generation of plant-based um, substitutes. And what I use to sort of define these from substitutes, uh, sort of older uh, plant-based products, is the approaches um, and use of technologies to try and push the boundaries of mimicry um, even further than, than they've gone before. So of course, these products are the latest chapter in a longer history of using plant-based ingredients to substitute for meat. Um, they're not really new in the sense of, you know, we've not had them before, but it is this, this kind of um, use of, of big data of certain technologies and also the geographies of, of production and innovation, which I'll come to um, a bit later on, that, that have kind of made them uh, uh, distinct and, and sort of uh, bring them into this category of, of a kind of recent alternative protein movement. So this includes companies that I'm sure you've heard of, sort of Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, um, and as I say, their, their kind of unique selling point is really pushing that mimicry to, to try and be indistinguishable from their conventional counterparts. So that's the sort of plant-based products that I tend to focus on. Also edible insects, so that I haven't really um, focused on insects since my uh, PhD, but they have formed part of some of my thinking around these alternative uh, proteins of activity. So um, these are sort of initiatives to try and introduce insects into particularly uh, sort of Western nations where there hasn't been a, at least a recent food culture of eating insects. This has mostly um, materialized through products where the insects are generally ground up. So um, they're used as a sort of protein ingredient in protein bars, um, also as flowers and powders rather than whole insects, but there have been some products, um, it's particularly in the UK, um, where you do see kind of the whole insects as well. Um, but generally they seem to be more um, ground up into uh, sort of bars and stuff. And then the other family of um, alternative proteins has its own sort of umbrella term um, called cellular agriculture. And these, uh, that encompasses two sort of broad approaches. So I have simplified it here, but two broad approaches. So the first one 
um, you can see here with the, the meat. Um, so, and there's been lots of different names for, for the, the meat. So this is like lab grown meat, cultured meat, cultivated meat. There's been a, a number of different terminology. I tend to use cultured meat, but you can, you can track that um, evolution of terms. And there's a paper that I wrote with um, Neil Stevens and Clemens Dyson, if you're interested in, in that evolution. Um, it is quite interesting part of the story of this sort of emerging industry. Um, but this essentially, the, the cultured meat tends to involve a process where you either take a biopsy of cells from a living animal, um, or you can have uh, go to sort of cell bank uh, and get immortalized cell lines. Um, but the idea is that you take those cells, you put them uh, into a growth medium, you incubate them, they grow, they proliferate, sort of multiply, um, and you end up with bigger, longer strands. And you can make, as you see um, at the bottom here, um, minced meat-like products. So that's really where most of the technology is at the moment. Um, there have been uh, attempts to build more complex, bigger cuts of meat. And that really is one of the um, the goals of the industry, but but the most of the products um, to date have been more of the the kind of meatball or burger or nugget sort of consistency. And then um, moving to the the far right of the screen, the other approach that falls under this cellular agriculture um, um, uh, umbrella term is what's often called fermentation based cellular agriculture. Um, so this is where you take a yeast cell or a bacteria cell, so usually a sort of single cell organism, um, and you genetically reprogram it to make the product, or sorry, the component that you want um, to then build the, the end product from the bottom up. So for instance, if you're wanting to make milk, you could reprogram a yeast cell so that when it's fermented, instead of producing alcohol, it could produce casein. And then you take that casein, you combine it with lipids, sugars, water, etc. And you're kind of building the product um, from, from the bottom up. So the, the sort of distinction of this approach um, compared to um, the cultured meat approach is that you're not using animal inputs. So that's just a very um, brief sort of overview of, of what I'm talking about when I use the term uh, alternative proteins. So one of the big questions um, that I've asked really from, from when I started uh, looking at these, these activities is, is the question of why now? And um, I mean, I'm sure I don't have to really uh, spell this out too much, but really it's coming from this, this age of anxiety that has, has developed um, over you know, recent decades about um, about the planet, about climate change, about all the different, um, unfortunately, planetary level um, problems and crises that we're facing, but particularly how food and even more particularly how uh, livestock are contributing to some of these um, tipping points, to some of these crises. And so you can trace the, the kind of debates that have done this linking um, in scientific discourse, in sort of policy discourse, and how the alternative protein sector have sort of picked up on that language and um, that's where a lot of this activity has emerged from as a, a kind of response and it's been interesting to see you know who um, who the faces are who the, the sort of catalysts are in in driving um, this turn towards doing protein differently and just to put a couple of faces up here who were quite instrumental um, in the early days this was around uh, 2013, this was the same year that we had the first um, cultured meat burger presented by Professor Mark Post from Maastricht University. It was presented in London um, in a big sort of TV uh, public event. And um, it, that was the same year that, that Bill Gates declared um, that food was ripe for reinvention. And um, it was uh, announced that Sergey Brin, who co-founder of Google, was one of the main investors in Mark Post's um, initial burger. So there was this interesting um, entry, really, of the high-tech uh, world of, of Silicon Valley, some of the biggest names in, in big tech, 
um, had kind of put alternative proteins on the radar. And that's something that, that I've been really interested in um, asking questions around, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean that Silicon Valley or, or, or big tech um, has been a big part of this story in the early days of, of this uh, emergent industry? And I can talk, um, I touch upon this a bit uh, later on, but I can talk more about that in the, the Q&A if um, that's something of interest. One of the um, interesting features, a bit like any um, sort of novel technological innovation, so it's not, it's not completely unique to alternative proteins, but over the last 10 years, um, they've existed largely um, as narratives rather than sort of tangible, eatable food stuff. So they've existed more in the public sphere or different public spheres um, as promises of what they will achieve in the future rather than as um, physical products in the present. And there's been a lot of social science work that has, has examined these narratives um, and particularly uh, looked at the political work that these narratives have been doing in the present. So kind of envisioning a future, but that has, has done stuff in the present. So it's, it's you know, helped to organize resources. It's helped to attract um, people to, to sort of do the do the research to, to build the companies but also importantly attract capital um, so financial resources uh, into the sector um, and so what part of this social science research has also uh, tried to map you know what is actually being promised and that has been some of the work that i've done um, and for time purposes i'm not going to um, spend too long on this but again i can talk more um, about it in the Q&A, but essentially what uh, some of the, I've put a paper at the top of the slide um, here that, that does this breaking down. So um, we created a kind of typology of different promises that, that we've observed um, from the alternative protein sector. So it, obviously all the promises do um, interlink and kind of work together, but we try to, for the purposes of the analysis, distill what are the different um, promises and who are they promising for um, when, when they're talking about their products. And I've just put a few examples at the bottom here. So um, the first one, the promise that it will be the same in terms of sensory experience, in terms of the eating practices. So you don't actually have to disturb your love of meat and milk. You can carry on eating it the same way that you've always done. Um, better for the environment, better for animals and better for human health. Um, and there are a few more in the paper if you're interested but ultimately the, the the kind of overarching promise of these alternative proteins is that they will be the same but better so better for you better for the planet better for animals um, and the kind of footnote or subtext of that is also better for profits and i'll, I'll come to that um, that particular point uh, a bit later on so for the interest of time, I kept that quite short. So I'm going to turn to um, some of the implications that, that I've been thinking through, because even though a lot of these alternative proteins have over the last decade existed more as narratives, as I mentioned, they have already started to do um, important material work. So have material impacts on how food systems and food economies are being organized. So I'm going to just talk through um, these three that, that um, my work has been looking at. So um, one of the, the, the big questions really that, that a lot of these alternative proteins have thrown up um, is what is meat? You know, what, what do we mean when we talk about meat? How do we define it? Um, and I think for a lot of people and, and you know, in different, for different publics, this has maybe seen like an unusual question or even an obvious question. Um, it's perhaps a category that's been taken for granted. Um, and, but a lot of researchers, you know, across anthropology, sociology, um, have of course been fascinated by meat and its status in different cultures. Um, and how, you know, building on that, what I've been interested in is how things like cultured meat and plant-based meat have really challenged what we think of as this, as this food category. And so I've just put this image up here as one 
you know, way that, that meat has been categorized or, or conceptualized. So you've got different cuts um, of meat coming from a particular animal. Um, each of the, the cuts have you know, their own name, their own material history. There's also, of course, um, when you think of meat, you might not think of the animal at all. Um, and this is one of the, the kind of big critiques, particularly um, for richer nations, you know, how um, a lot of this has become increasingly disconnected from where meat comes from, um, down to the very kind of material presentation of it in shops where it's completely, you know, cut up, it's, it's de-skinned, de-boned, you know, all reference to the animal has uh, been removed. Um, uh, so different kind of ways that, that meat has been imagined and presented and how we might think of it. So that's one way that we might think of meat, but there's also kind of regulatory um, definitions. That's another way that the, the kind of meaning making of meat um, has been constructed. So I've put up here the EU uh, definition of meat. And what's interesting in, in this and, and other definitions that I'm, I'm going to put up is what is specified here. So um, in this definition of meat uh, is linked to skeletal muscle and it has to have its origins in specific animal species. So towards the end of the quote, it says, you know, meat doesn't include fish and seafood. And then um, that there are other species that are, that are listed that um, are linked to this idea of what meat is. If we move on to the US definition, uh, regulatory definition, it's kind of the same picture. So um, again, you've got at the bottom here reference to skeletal muscle. Um, you've got reference to, again, specific animal species. Um, and also it goes a little bit further in talking about carcasses. So it's very clear that in these definitions, meat is coming from specific animals and it's coming from um, a once living animal. So the whole body is involved. Um, but not only is the whole body involved, but it's specific parts of the body um, that, that meat uh, is defined as. And so what was interesting um, is in recent years, in response to um, particularly cultured meat, but, but also um, plants and insects. Um, some of the, the big powerful uh, lobby groups in places like the US have had responses to, to these developments and um, sort of reacting in regulatory and legal terms and questioning these categories, questioning how these alternatives um, shouldn't be defined um, legally as meat um, in particular. And what's interesting to trace in these reactions um, is how, again, this idea of meat is being, is being emphasized. And, and it, it comes back again to it has to be coming from animals, but there's a real emphasis, as I said, on the life and death of animals. So they have to be born, raised, and harvested. Um, and of course, you know, the, the alternatives don't involve um, those processes in that traditional manner. But this idea of a traditional manner isn't just to do with um, the production processes, it's also um, to do with provenance. So um, as you see at the top here, um, there's a specific mention to farmers and ranchers. So a real um, sort of pointing to the, the people or the skill sets and by extension, um, the, the kind of geography, so the locations of where production takes place so on farms on ranches um, so this is as i say I, I found this very interesting to see how meat has been um challenged by these alternatives um and then how certain stakeholder groups are are kind of defending the category and in doing so um there's a, a sort of political um you can look at it through a political lens to see you know why are they defending it in these ways if you're interested in some of these um, reactions and responses I, I've put um, the, some of the papers that uh, I've done uh, that have looked into these, these developments. So just to go through how some of these alternative um, proteins are challenging, these more maybe traditional or, or um, uh, general uh, definitions of meat. So um, as I've previously mentioned, they don't 
uh, they, they remove the need for slaughter and rearing. So they're essentially, in, in the simplest sense, taking death out of the, uh, well, maybe you could say life and death, but it depends on um, how maybe you're, you're defining what life is at the cellular level. But certainly they're trying to remove death from, from the process. They're removing um, the whole animal body um, in the traditional sense of, of raising a, a whole animal and then building products from the bottom up instead. And they're relocating production away from those more traditional spaces of, of meat production um, and dairy production, et cetera, um, and putting them more into places like labs initially, but, ascent, but eventually um, looking more to like big brewery kind of fermentation uh, facilities. And then also opening up this idea of, of um, the species of animals that, that these products could, um, you know, could be made from. So there's been sort of visionary talks about being able to eat extinct animals um, or even endangered animals. So maybe you can have your panda meat, but not actually kill uh, any pandas. There's also talk of chimera kind of products where you're, you're mixing uh, meat, you know, animal cells in ways that you couldn't do through more conventional breeding. And then there's also been talk about uh, human meat. And um, for some, this, is, this has been a, a sort of philosophical discussion. There's not been any attempts to actually do this, but I think it has been interesting philosophically, um, particularly for animal uh, studies scholars to think about how cultured meat could, um, could sort of challenge the, the hierarchy that has existed where you know, we have as humans, eaten some animals, loved others as companions and, and eaten others, and whether um, cultured human meat could be the ultimate in, in a levelling of that, that speciesism. Um, so if you're interested in that, I can point you to some of the, the philosophical papers on that, and I'm just going to, I'll leave that point there for, for discussion if, uh, if you want to talk about that in the Q&A. So all of this um, I found really interesting to think about this category of meat and it, and it just shows that um, meat really isn't a stable object. It's not a stable category as might be expected. And, and there has been a lot of work, as I've said, in anthropology um, particularly, that has been interested in these questions and, and particularly across different cultures, how meat, that this category of meat is, is different um, and can be seen as different across time and uh, geography. And so this, is, this has helped me to, to think about me as this kind of unstable and contextual um, object. So something that is enacted through different practices and, and, and different contexts. Um, and one of the, the kind of helpful ways that, that this has helped me to unpack some of the, the responses to things like cultured me is, is to really unpack um, not only meat as a, a kind of object, as a category, but also how things become seen as edible or perceived as food. And so I've turned to, um, again, work particularly in anthropology. Um, there's a, a book um, called Animal to Edible um, by Noelle Vial. And she did this really great uh, anthropological study of abattoirs in France. And her um, work was interested in how a living animal kind of goes into a space and comes out the other end as food, you know, as edible matter, rather than just being turned into a corpse or, you know, a sort of murdered animal. So that what she traced was a series of different spaces, of different utensils, of different things, of different people um, and skill sets that, that turn a living animal into food. And that also extends beyond the abattoir to think about, you know, the, the way it's transported, but also um, into the retail environment as well. So the way that food is labelled has a huge influence on how we perceive it, not only as desirable, but also as an edible substance. So I'm thinking particularly of you know, GM um, for, for a lot of people, if it's GM, um, it's not considered uh, food. It's, going back to that, that label of uh, sort of franken food. So this is just trying to, I guess, illustrate how um, 
food and particularly meat is enacted through this assemblage of different practices of different things that, that transform a living animal into an edible um, food substance. And so what this has helped me to think about is what happens when you take this, this kind of pathway um, from animal to edible and you swap it for this uh, in the middle. And it's helped me just to, as I say, to unpack particularly the, the kind of yuck factor or just the, um, the resistances um, from some in, in the incumbent livestock industry as to, as to why this seems like such an affront to, um, to the way of creating meat. And so really it's about disturbing this accepted pathway. And I've put a pathway up here that, you know, isn't the, the only pathway, of course. Um, it's, it's very contextual, particularly to a kind of Western European um, pathway, but um, this still, this sort of middle section is what is being disturbed. And it's, and it's bringing in new technologies, new kind of uh, skill sets, new stakeholder groups, new political economies into the production of meat. And so I've just put this up here as one of the themes that I have explored um, to kind of get into the yuck factor that I was talking about, but also to try and start to understand how um, these products are disturbing this, as I say, this pathway and bringing in new stakeholders and new politics into this industry, into this, this process of creating meat. So um, just to recap this particular section, so alternative proteins are legally challenging this dependency of meat deriving from an animal and particularly from a death of an animal. Um, and so that has opened up lots of really interesting ethical debates, as I say, particularly amongst um, critical animal um, studies, but, but also in broader kind of food ethics um, as well. Legally and culturally um, challenging the categorization of particular species of animal, but also who is involved in, in the production. So in that, that sort of middle sector of, of the pathway that I put up on the previous slide. Um, and on a more kind of conceptual uh, basis, I think it's been really interesting to think of how uh, making meat from cells has either challenged or not people's perceptions of that animal being turned into an edible substance. So again, there's a paper at the bottom there um, if you're interested in, in these particular themes. So just shifting now to more um, I guess what I would term maybe more on the ground realities, the ways that these alternative proteins are um, shifting and reimagining the power relations within food systems and, and particularly protein food systems. Um, so to taking that pathway that I talked about, the, the middle point saying, well, that's being um, changed in particular ways. So what does that mean for who, um, who is involved? Who will the winners and losers be from this new way of doing uh, protein production. So one of the, the narratives um, that has been sort of come up again and again um, in the, the promotional materials of these alternative proteins is that these products will remove the bottleneck um, within meat production in particular. So the idea that uh, this is what's, part, what's the broken part of the food system. It's the fact that we go to animals for our protein. But one of the critiques that I've um, argued in my work is that by focusing only on this potential or particular bottleneck, um, it ignores this other bottleneck. So this is a, um, a figure here that's tried to capture how power is distributed unevenly in the food system. So you've got farmers at the bottom here, um, consumers at the top and you've got this funnel, there's this bottleneck in the, in the middle of just a handful of companies that control um, the flow essentially, control the, the choice between uh, farmers and, and consumers. And so one of the, the, as I say, the critiques that I've been unpacking and exploring in my work is that by just swapping out the animal for cells or plants, it's, it's not really doing anything to challenge that, that, that bottleneck in the, in the political, political economy um, of food systems. So I've put a snapshot up here of the 
of this sort of political economic landscape of the alternative protein sector. So this is uh, from 2020, so it'll already be out of date because it moves so quickly. Um, but just briefly at the top, you've got a number of the startup companies that are creating these products. In the middle, you've got the institutions that are supporting that sort of R&D, so universities to nonprofits. And at the bottom, you've got the, the organisations and people funding this activity. And I just want to draw your attention um, to the bottom right hand corner. So this really um, is a more recent chapter where incumbent agri-food industry has come on board and started investing in these alternatives. And those are the companies that occupy that, that middle um, of, the, of the hourglass I showed you on the previous slide. So for me, this is a question about, you know, what is actually being disrupted um, by these alternative proteins, because that's one of the, the favorite kind of buzzwords um, of this sector and, and the kind of big tech sector more generally. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking in my work, you know, across different timeframes. So it might be shifting practices by the biggest food companies in the short term. Um, so, you know, if McDonald's, for instance, shifts to plant-based burgers, that will obviously have a, a, a quite immediate and um, global scale impact. But what are the longer term commitments to more systemic change? And can these alternative proteins in the way that they're currently being done, can they actually bring about that? that systemic change to how we do food um, in the way that they're currently enrolling. So that's been part of my sort of critical work um, on this sector. And just to give you a, a sense of, of the geographies of some of this work, so the green are um, plant-based meat companies um, over recent years and uh, the cultured meat companies um, are the orange ones. So again, there's a, there's a particular geography here that again speaks to what is actually being disrupted. Um, where is the power over the production of protein? How will that evolve um, in, into the future? Are we just seeing a, a sort of further entrenchment of, of power over food production in the global north and, and the global south, sort of being the consumers, the, the sort of food um, insecure uh in the global south so this again is is part of the of the critique as this this industry um evolves and a particular concentration within the global north has been silicon valley um and this has been a big part of my work is to ask as i said how has this why does this matter you know, does it matter that it, it is concentrated here um so early in its um evolution and one of the my recent papers have said, yes, it has mattered um, because it's br brought this idea of food being software. So um, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, um, but essentially the principles of modern computing are now being applied to how we think about um, food or these companies, these new companies are thinking about food. And um, there are important and um, interesting implications for thinking you know what does that mean for not only who is involved in in this sort of future of protein production um but also who has ownership and how how ownership and power um are organized um in these companies so by thinking of food as software it has generally prioritized companies that have a high-tech product um that have a for-profit company and who can attach um intellectual property to their product. So it's a particular way of doing innovation um, that is being kind of pushed through this, this thinking. Um, and I've linked that to the particular geography of Silicon Valley. Um, so yeah, I can talk more about that in the, in the q and I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to um, skip on. So as a, just a kind of counter vision um, here, there have been ideas around cultured meat um, in particular, actually decentralizing meat production in the future. So there has been this idea of, of every village having its own factory or perhaps farmers having bioreactors on their farms. And um, so it could actually revitalize different kinds of farming at, at different scales. And this is really where my work at the moment is concentrating um, in, in a project that I'm hoping uh, we'll get funding next year and we can actually explore and test these, these ideas of, of doing alternative proteins and particularly cultured meat differently rather than the big kind of big industry version of it 
it's we, we want to sort of test this idea that it could be done differently so hopefully if that gets funded um, I can come back maybe and uh, share some of the findings um, from that so I just was going to end with some um, some kind of challenges and opportunities so I, I, I gave a presentation to um, the EU Green Party who were trying to work out their position on um, cultured meat and I gave a, a presentation that just ran through some of the, the kind of opportunities and challenges um, that that I see in particular for things like cultured meat so I thought I would just end by running through um, some of these so the first um, category was to do with public health so some of the opportunities that have been linked to um, particularly cultured meat um, but also you know doing doing plant-based um, alternatives as well is that they remove the risk of pathogens that uh, and contamination that are associated with getting your animal products from animal bodies and also um, at the point of slaughter um, the idea that you're removing the need for intensive livestock um, environments and um, then by extension removing one of the biggest uses of antibiotics uh, globally is in is in uh, the livestock industry and then a particular point that has been emphasized in in the the context um, of covid is your hopefully then removing um, risks of future pandemics and antimicrobial uh, resistance. And also this idea that you have greater control over the nutritional content. So if you're building these products from the bottom up, you can sort of tailor the products more easily than doing it um, through animal bodies. Some of the challenges in the context of public health. So um, one way to really you know, reduce the risk of contamination of pathogens is to automate the process as much as possible. But this then obviously has consequences for job creation and livelihoods in the sector. There's a massive um, point that, that I have been focusing on um, around addition rather than replacement. So a lot of companies, particularly the incumbent livestock industry um, have been very positive about you know investing in these products but a lot of them are just simply adding these products to their existing portfolios rather than thinking about you know directly replacing um, their conventional activity so that's something that we really have to um, think about moving forward and that has public health consequences for you know what is on the market is it actually creating healthier a healthier landscape but also in terms of the you know, environmental, uh, all of the impacts, really, if we're only adding more stuff to um, the retail environment, to the production environment, then we're not really, uh, they're not really delivering on all of their, their promises. Um, so that's something that really has to, has to be focused on um, as this sector kind of moves to its next stages. Um, we need more info, really, on um, this claim of zero antibiotics once they're at scale. Um, and also once the products leave the sort of controlled factory environment. Um, so the way that they behave, if they haven't been in an animal body, they've been in a completely sterile environment once they leave um, that environment. And there needs to be more research on, on what happens in, in, in terms of contamination um, of the product. Um, and there's also just more kind of nutritional science work to be done around how to create products building them up um, from, from the bottom up, uh, how it might change the functionality if you're sort of growing fat separately and then putting it in the product. So there are some sort of food science questions still to, to think through and then how that actually affects the nutritional profile and the nutritional availability um, of different um, micronutrients in the final product. Um, in terms of the environment, so you might have seen a lot of early life cycle analyses have promised a huge uh, sort of environmental wins in terms of uh, climate change, biodiversity, etc. But one of the, the, the more certain ones, um, if this product can you know, be done at scale, is that there will hopefully be major savings in the land um, footprint, so hopefully reclaiming a lot of land from um, agricultural production and hopefully you know giving that over to 
um, conservation, rewilding, um, other kinds of uh, sort of environmentally uh, focused uses. Just to highlight a few um, challenges of this, so the there is a projected high energy use and that's a, a big obstacle for, for particularly cultured meat um, and really the environmental benefits from this technology um, will only be realised if the whole process can also be decarbonised. So it's kind of a big caveat in terms of uh, the energy is, is a, a big obstacle for actually delivering on their environmental uh, promises. The growth serum in, in terms of both ethical and environmental um, impacts still remains a barrier. If it, uh, if it can move to plant-based, then hopefully that can be uh, overcome. But as it stands, um, the process is both animal-based and very energy intensive and expensive. Um, we need more precise data on these products at scale because a lot of the modeling has been done at the kind of lab scale. Um, so it's not sure how these will translate once you get to sort of bigger pilot plants. A lot of single-use plastics are used currently in tissue culture, um, so that needs to be thought through. And this idea of freeing up land, it sounds great, but we really need very strong protections and policy frameworks to ensure that whatever that land use is changed to isn't worse than currently, um, you know, as it currently exists in conventional animal agriculture. So that's one of the, the kind of policy um, highlights that we need to focus on. Um, I'm conscious I've got to the end of my time, so I'll just put uh, these up as a, my final slide. Um, it kind of comes back to some of the, the political questions that um, I talked about earlier, but the opportunities in terms of outperforming and replacing the, the multiple harms of factory farming, um, there has been talk of new opportunities and incentives for creating highly skilled agricultural jobs, um, you know, bringing in young farmers, new entrants into the sector, kind of making farming exciting through, through these technologies. Um, there is some potential for current food producers to supply these alternative industries. So again, that's something that my, um, hopefully my future project is going to really get into to see where those opportunities are for already existing um, livestock and um, arable farmers. And as I mentioned, this, this potential for a decentralized future um, of having cultured meat, you know, at smaller scales of, of production. Um, but just to offer sort of counter arguments here, there are still major skills and cost barriers um, to get into this industry, and particularly for smaller businesses um, and particularly outside of the, the richer nations. Um, this idea of automation versus job creation, I think, is a is a looming um, question mark that, that needs more thinking. Um, the ingredients, as far as is currently understood, um, require quite highly standardized replicable properties that, that are most suited to a kind of industrialized agriculture and also pharmaceutical production. So both this point and the final point um, about how the big incumbents are already getting into these alternatives um, it kind of challenges this idea of a decentralized vision but that's not to say that multiple futures can't exist um, at the same time um, but it's really trying to think through you know which ones will will have the most um, sort of power will have where, where will most of the resources kind of end up and certainly in the short term it seems that it is this kind of big big food big pharmaceutical kind of uh, version of these alternatives are pushing the agenda. Um, so I'm going to stop there um, and look forward to any uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, do you want to stop sharing your screen there? Yeah. Thank you. And look, that was terrific. Thanks so much. You gave us a real uh, overview and touched on a range of issues that, and themes that you've been exploring over a number of years in your work. Um, so that was great. And look, I really appreciate in your work the way you really explore the question of transformation that these technologies and new products are bringing. There's no doubt they are bringing transformation, but not necessarily the ones that they promise. <laughs> there are other transformations that happen, but transformations in, in meanings around food, but the cultures and structures of production and consumption. So you're really across, I think, a whole range of issues. 
So thank you. So look, we've got we've got some time, and look, we can go a few minutes over time here because um, we, we started a little bit later. So by all means, I think we can go ten minutes over. If people want to stick around and ask some questions. Um, okay, let's open it up. Uh, over to you, Nick. Hi, Alex. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. I, I was just had a question. I was just wondering why is it that humans are so obsessed about making plant proteins and other proteins look like meat? You know, why, why do we have to make everything look like meat? Because, of course, it's going to require a lot more processing. Um, so it's going to be much less, less um, um, you know, good, good for the environment. And, and also, um, it's, it, you know, it means that you're going to lose a lot of the, the, the nutrients that are, that are included in those products if you have to go through this high processing to make the product look like a meat. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting um, question. And I think one of the, one of the things I always come back to for, for this kind of question is what in my, in my interviews with the companies that have been creating these products is that they see their products not as the kind of vegan or vegetarian option. They, they often don't use that language um, on their products because their target audiences are the, the carnivores. Um, so they want to appeal to the people to meat eaters essentially. And so what they see is they're trying to make um, the right choice, the, the easy choice for people who already enjoy um, animal products. So recognizing that a lot of food choices and food practices are um, very sensory, they're, they're often precognitive, they're emotional, um, they come from, you know, food cultures, uh, kind of history, history of, of food cultures and food environments. So um, I could answer your question in a different way, a sort of bigger question of why do we love eating, you know, animal flesh and, <laughs> and things like that. And I think that's a bigger sort of historical anthropological um, discussion about the status of, of animal uh, flesh and, and in, in you know different different cultures and across times but I think speaking specifically to why are these companies and why is so much money being put into trying to make plants sizzle like meat and cells you know behave like uh, milk for instance is because these companies are almost accepting that those tastes won't change um, that we've tried to make the bean patties and, and get people to eat lentils and in their minds it hasn't worked. Um, plus the kind of animal activism shouting at the, the, the sort of industrial gates also hasn't created this major shift to um, animal free eating. And so in their minds they're kind of saying well rather than trying to, to um, disrupt those tastes let's meet those tastes, but change the way that, that we are creating them, we're, we're sort of uh, producing the, the materials that go behind them. So um, that's, the, that's the, the kind of reasoning, but of course we can have a, a, a philosophical um, and important, you know, a, a very material debate about whether continuing to reify animal flesh and other products even if they're not coming from a slaughtered or, or animal that's suffered, um, we could still talk about whether that is the, the right thing um, to do. So it, it, this is why I love this topic is because it, it's a blend of all of this in a very sort of philosophical, ethical, um, as well as political and cultural um, themes. So I hope that gets to, to some of your questions. We just remind everyone to use the hands up function uh, on uh, on Zoom. And before we go to Jen, was did um, did Jeremy have a question that I missed? Jeremy, are you there? Jeremy's no. here, so Jeremy oh. Cluster. Oh, good no, Jeremy Skews. 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 Yeah. Jeremy, you got to you got to, got to feed your family as well, or you still there? No, no, I haven't got to feed my family. I <laughs> thank God. Um, it's, I'm just wondering, has there been a kosher or a halal view expressed on any of these alternative uh, proteins? I guess insect protein would be a problem. Um, and I just wonder, you know, because without their tick of approval, it probably won't go very far, will it? Yes, they have. And I, I'd be happy to um, 
to share. There's been there's been academic papers, there's been um, various panels at, at industry conferences um, with religious leaders who have discussed um, both halal and kosher um, statuses of these products, um, particularly around cultured meat and the components that go into um, uh, because some of it involves, you know, fecal bovine serum, which has elements of, of blood and other things. Um, so I can, yeah, I can definitely forward those to you if, uh, if you're interested. Um, it's, it's been a, there have been particular markets that have been identified by the industry as saying this is another opportunity um, with our products. But of course, like you say, it's a, it's a dialogue and it's not, um, it's something that has been debated. Um, so. I'd be happy to, to share those. Super, thank you. Jennifer. Thanks, Alex. Really interesting. Um, I'd say I was especially interested in the, in the power dimensions you talked about, this idea that it's basically just reifying the global north-south divide. Um, and I was just curious, when you're talking about that sort of push to have the bioreactor in every village, that sounds great, fantastic, we'll produce it in the global south. Um, has there been much concern or do you have much perspective, I suppose, on whether this is just going to look like another sort of um, Gates Foundation investment um, where they control all of the technology, they control all of the IP, et cetera, um, and they basically just sort of rent it um, and it still sort of just reifies that um, divide? Absolutely, yeah. This, is, this really is at the crux of, of a lot of my critical work are those very questions. And I think um, particularly laying that over that global north-south divide um, is, is really important and I think will only become more important over the coming years because most of the activity to date, as I said, has been mostly at the lab scale um, and it's only in the last year and kind of looking forward over the next year, um, couple of years, that we're going to see or we're promised that there will be big pilot or the first round of pilot um, facilities. And so I think that's going to be um, potentially a big kick forward in terms of where the industry is going to be set up um, and who is funding it um, and of course as you said how it will function economically in terms of will it be licensed as a technology because these these facilities you know cost hundreds of millions of dollars to to produce and there's no currently there's no guarantee that they will be viable um, both technically or economically so I think as a, a kind of short answer to your question is I think you it is likely to see these um, existing models um, sort of financial models or, or business models where they might be the facilities might be built um, in all around the world but the question as you say is who is owning the technology who is putting in that financial capital to, to take the risk by building facilities and therefore how does that affect how the technology is owned and and I'm not saying that there can't be potential for multiple futures, as I mentioned, but I think the current trajectory, and this is really what my work focuses on, is the current trajectory is giving the signs that really it is business as usual in terms of those uh, power dynamics. So have to remain uh, critically vigilant um, as researchers of that. Uh, Anya. Hi, Georgi. Hi, Alice. Um, Alex, sorry, really great to meet you because I've been reading your work for a little while now. And I see Alistair has actually touched on my point ahead of time. So sorry, Alistair, I'm stealing your second point, which is, have you, I mean, you probably have seen the claims around that livestock are essential for sustainable agriculture systems, particularly soil health. Um, do you think, do you see this as more of a discursive tool being used by the livestock industry against alternative proteins or do you see that there's sort of validity because I noticed it wasn't in your environmental um, cons column so I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah this is um, this is such a big issue um, and yeah it was mostly because of time um, that I, I didn't include it and it, it continues to be as I'm sure you're aware um, massively contentious within conventional agricultural circles about the, the role that that especially ruminant livestock can play as a climate solution. Um, it's definitely one of the things I guess I should I should highlight is in all of my work that has looked at the narratives and counter narratives from both the alternative protein industry and the, the incumbent livestock industry 
history is that they're not kind of homogenous groups on either side. So it's not just a kind of alternative versus conventional. Um, so there are different groups acting within those that have different views on the role of, of livestock, for instance. So some companies, um, some cultured meat companies, for instance, are putting farmers quite centrally into their visions. So, you know, um, particularly in Europe, a lot of the companies are wanting to work with farmers. There's LF farms in Israel who have also put quite a lot of effort into trying to, to work with farmers. So I think there is a sense from the industry that at least for some of the, the companies that there can be a role. There is a recognition that, that livestock animals um, farmed in certain ways could, could be part of, of uh, climate friendly um, food production, as well as the recognizing the kind of cultural value of, of livestock animals um, and the livelihoods that are attached to them. Um, but then there are others who say very publicly, we're going to end all livestock farming by X year, which um, you know, you can you can unpack that how you how you want to. I think a lot of that is part of this promissory performance of you know of of the disruptive potential of these products. But um, but then on the flip side, you know, within conventional animal uh, agriculture circles, um, I think there are different attitudes towards these products, seeing them both as opportunities for furthering certain types of animal farming, but for a lot of people, obviously seeing it as a threat. And so this. Getting into these thorny issues is really where my future work is going to is going to dive into. So um, yeah, hopefully I can have um, a, a deeper answer to that <laughs> in the coming years. Thanks. I'm just going to ask a question from Alastair Isles in the chat. I mean, uh, Anya asked one of his second question, but I'll just ask the first one. Alastair mentioned uh, the claims that factory-made meat will be safer and free from contamination overlooks the origins of a lot of food safety risks in the ways that industrial systems pull meat from many animals and from feedlots in the US that is. In other words, this is a technological fix to an industrial production problem. You want to respond to that? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, as I, as I, I maybe whistled through this a bit too quickly, but I, I um, if I'm just reading your question, um, it overlooks the origin. I mean, th there is no, I think a lot of the, the promise of greater control, greater kind of purity of the end product, greater cleanliness um, in the production process is still massive question marks because it hasn't been tested. Um, and like you say, it's coming from, um, it's a solution to a particular problem um, of an industrialized animal uh, system that could have other there could be other solutions so just not farming animals intensively so it really comes back to this idea that the alternative proteins are not disturbing our taste for animal products but also um, the kind of cultures of consumption the rates of consumption um, of, of both well both production and consumption so they're kind of saying look we can produce as much or even more than we're currently producing um, but we'll do it differently and promise to have smaller footprints. Um, so it, it is, like you say, it's a techno fix to what has already been a kind of techno fix through industrialising animal agriculture. And what is missing from a lot of these conversations is, well, do we, should we be producing that much meat and milk? Should we be eating this much meat and milk? Um, and other animal products and actually is the problem the cultures of overproduction and overconsumption of these food groups and should we actually be is the solution or part of the solution not trying to produce and consume other um, products like whole based plant based foods for for instance so um yeah it, it it's all muddied in there and it can often the simplified hype can can sort of uh, skate over at those complexities and the, the kind of origins of how problems and solutions are being framed and then what is getting left off the table um, as a result. Thank you. Uh, Aisha. Thanks, Gilgi, and thanks very much, Alex, for a really excellent presentation. Um, I was just interested, you know, you spoke about the increasing role of like big food, big tech and big pharma 
in alternative proteins. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, to the implications of, you know, all three of these sort of big industries and whether you think there are only sort of risks and challenges or whether there are any opportunities there as well. Yeah, so my work does, does tend to focus on, on the risks, but, but, you know, if I speak to the opportunities first, I guess it really comes back to what your, um, what the goal is. So for a lot of founders, you know, they've come into this alternative protein space, not because they want to entrench the power of agri-food incumbents, but because um, a lot of them have, have come from kind of animal rights, animal activism um, missions. And so if the goal is to try and reduce the amount of animals currently suffering and, and dying um, in the global food system, then the logic goes that you need to reach scale and impact as quickly as possible. So the benefit, the potential benefit of partnering with the big powerful incumbent livestock industry, um, pharmaceutical industries and big tech is that they all operate and have successful precedent um, at those big global scales. Um, they have you know, the political power, they have the economic capital, they have the cultural capital. Um, that is a slightly more complex, you know, over recent years, the, the kind of reputational um, capital of some of the biggest food, food companies, particularly the more public facing one, is a bit more complex than historically where they have been much more trusted, but still the kind of the, the cultural visibility maybe is a better way of putting that. Um, and accessibility as well. If you get these products into every Burger King, every McDonald's, you know, it's it's much more accessible than um, a niche kind of pop-up restaurant um, in Singapore that like happened um, last year. So those are the, the perceived benefits really for getting these products out there to scales of production and, and economies of scale as quickly um, as possible. But of course, as I mentioned in the in the talk, it doesn't guarantee that they will continue to replace their conventional offerings. Um, and we're already seeing that in market data. So Burger King um, announced in a, in a news report that um, what they're seeing isn't actually people coming in and buying, I think it's the Impossible Burger in Burger King um, and, and swapping that for the, the beef version. It's actually vegetarians and vegans and, and new customers are coming in and buying that. So it's addition rather than replacement, which is one of my um, themes. So I think it, the opportunities and challenges, the way I think about it is across different timeframes. So there might be benefits in the short term, but without longer term commitments to actually having that systemic change. Those are my, where my concerns lie. And, and history tells us that these big companies don't really do systemic change. That's my, uh, <laughs> my take on it. Thanks, we might just have time for one more question, I think, Christine. Thanks, Georgi. Um, and thanks, Alex, for a super interesting talk. I wanted to ask you something about the analogy with Silicon Valley. So I think I sort of got the point that you were saying that the development of these products is similar um, model of technological innovation based on intellectual property. Um, but I was just curious about whether you'd thought about whether there was a sort of deeper level of um, analogy or the same kind of thinking between the actual production of and marketing of these um, products with the digital economy. So I think earlier on in your talk, you sort of said it's a bit like big data, but I, I yeah, so I'm curious, you know, so are they using data? Are they using personalization? Is there a sort of marketing angle? Is there some way that we can think of these in, in a more um, materi material or non-material senses like um, Facebook and Google mm -hmm. and, and so on? Yeah, so I, yeah, I could have said so much more because this, as I said, was one of my recent papers um, called Food as Software, where I really get into all of that. So if you're interested in that, um, I definitely point you 
point you to that paper, but it's definitely um, the, the sort of material alignment of these protein products and, and, and the processes that are involved with that kind of culture, with that material culture, with the, the kind of um, political economic culture of Silicon Valley is, is so interesting. And it's the argument that I make in the paper that yes, there is that, that kind of um, overlap and that how we're seeing that materialize is through the marketing of the product. So I think I flashed up an image of um, Beyond Burger kind of marketing their, their latest product as um, Beyond Burger 2.0. So kind of using the language that we tend to see with Apple and, and you know, other kind of big tech um, companies. So it's sort of a, a public facing um, sort of uh, presentation of these products as tech but then carefully balancing that with sort of not too much tech because they're also food because a lot of people don't like to think of, of eating uh, tech so th there's a really careful dance and, and that is not only in the public kind of facing aspects but also in my interviews um, founders of the companies would tell me that when they're talking to investors um, and particularly investors in Silicon Valley they would really emphasize the technology that, well, that their products are technology first and food second, because a lot of the investors um, don't have a history of investing in food. It's not something that they're familiar with or perhaps interested in, but they do have a history of investing in tech and particularly kind of information technology based products. Um, so there has been a, a kind of reframing or a particular framing within the companies of how they talk about their, their products and also the decisions I would argue that they've made um, to involve big data. So the, what I was referencing there was companies um, that have used big data to sort of screen thousands of different plant species to try and figure out their functionality and nutritional properties to think, you know, can I use this bean to scramble like eggs or can I use this other thing to, to chew like meat? So that's where the big data comes in. Um, but I think it's important to always be thinking, you know, yes, that's that's interesting and, and it could be novel in certain ways, but is some of it actually just a, a packaging of, you know, we're doing, we're doing data, we're doing kind of technology, um, because a lot of that framing has done important political work of, of trying to attract certain investors and, and attract um, certain uh, really attention from, you know, the Silicon Valley kind of uh, community. Um, and then through that, get the attention of the world. So. All of that is what I get into in, in that um, economic geography paper. So I would, yeah, for a, for a more in-depth and probably better uh, explanation, you could look at it, look at that paper. Thanks. We should probably um, wrap up there because um, uh, we've gone way over time. Thanks for giving the extra time, Alex. I, should, I didn't I forgot to mention Alex had to get up really, really quite early this morning. Uh, her time to for this talk, particularly because we've got our times mixed up a bit with daylight savings. So thank you for that. Thanks everyone for coming along. This was a great turnout. And thanks for your questions. Um, and Alex, look, thanks again. Look, Alex, we I really love your work. Um, really followed over the years, and we look forward to some publications coming out of your your current work as well. So uh, thank you so much. Um, um, and also, as Robin said at the start too, just this is the first of a series of, of monthly seminars. So. We'll, we'll certainly let you know of, of more coming up. And just you, on everyone. that, the question from Bridget on the attrition aspects, I think we'll cover that in a future seminar. So thanks, Bridget. Thanks, Georgi. Really great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Georgi, for sharing. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Min, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone.